Well, hello and welcome to the Beginner's Guide to SEO. I mean, SEO is a pretty wide and complex field, so a lot of the strategies we're going to talk about here are kind of at beginner level. Uh, but you need to get kind of the beginner concepts and foundations in place before you can kind of move on to more complex strategies. But I've tried, tried to tailor this to be very actionable to you as, as new business owners. So a lot of the tools that I'll talk about, I'll give free options for you to use. Okay, so... My name is Adam Bowles. I'm head of SEO for Suso Digital. We're a London-based um, SEO agency. We only do SEO. Um, we know the kind of full spectrum of digital marketing, but we're primarily doing organic SEO. I myself have worked in numerous industries across a whole um, sway of verticals, from highly competitive keywords <coughs> to working with startups. So, what is SEO? SEO is essentially just another marketing channel for your business. It, it is inbound marketing, where traditional marketing is very disruptive. Um, SEO and inbound marketing, your customers are actively looking for you. So they're using the search engines to target you. So it's, it's a very effective form of marketing because we're not disrupting the customer. We're not cold calling them. They are actively looking for, for your service. So it's, so it's a case of targeting the people. So, SEO is essentially improving a website's organic visibility within the search engines. Now, if you're targeting the UK market, Google's dominance in the UK is so big, you only really need to focus on Google. If you're targeting the US, Bing, is, Bing has a much higher market share over there. If you're targeting Russia, you need to look at Yandex. If you're targeting China, you need to look at Beidou. Now, what do we mean by organic visibility? Well, essentially, a typical search results page. So we're looking at these results here, as opposed to these results here, which is paid advertising. So this is part of Google's AdWords program. Now the benefit of the organic search results is that people trust them. People trust them more than they trust the ads. The benefit of being on the first page is absolutely massive, especially for if you have a highly competitive keyword. The thing is, SEO is hard. You know, I'm not really going to sugarcoat it for you. The, 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 the benefits that you get from it appearing on the first page of Google and other search engines means that competition is massive. There are only 10 spots available on the first page. Therefore, if you knock somebody off that first page, they will respond and they will continue to optimize their site further. Google also doesn't want you to do SEO. It's a simple matter of fact that Google's business model is very, very, very simple. They have the best search results out of all the search engines. So people use them. And then a percentage of those people click on the advertising. And then Google sells the advertising to the customer. So the more money and time you invest into SEO, the less time and money you invest into the advertising. Therefore, we don't know what Google's algorithm is that ranks the websites. They keep that completely secret. Us as SEOs, we have to test and we have to, have to experiment to understand what the algorithm is. To make things worse, they release hundreds and hundreds of updates to the algorithm every single year, which makes it even harder. For the purpose of this, for this seminar, we're going to be doing an example site. So this is a site by one of the Ingenuity Lab members. This will just kind of give you a bit more context to what I'm saying. So, SEO kind of comprises of two main parts. There's the on-site, which is essentially the technical elements of it. So how your website is set up. Does, do the search engines understand the purpose of the site? Can they index the site? Which, which keywords are you using on the site? And the off-site, this is more where the creative marketeer comes into play. Being an SEO, you kind of blur the lines between a technical web developer and a creative marketeer, and you just kind of meet in the middle somewhere. Both of these aspects have kind of a, a symbiotic relationship. If your on-site doesn't work, your website won't rank. If your off-site is terrible, your website won't rank. Both of these things need to be working in perfect harmony for a website to even stand a chance of ranking within search engines. I'll get onto that more later. Um, so, 
yeah, it's, it is a lot more to go into. Um, so, if we go through a kind of a typical search engine <coughs> campaign, the first thing you need to do is collect data. Data is the foundation of any online marketing activity. If you're not collecting data, you can't really make any educated decisions. So, first thing I do, I start tracking keywords. Now this is where your site ranks in the search engines for your keywords that you choose to target. Now keyword tracking is a little bit difficult because the search engine results page are now ridiculously personalized. If I search for one thing here and I search for another thing in London, I'd get completely different results. But it's still useful to know where you rank within the search engines. Do you have pages that are on the second page that with a slight few tweaks to, you could push up to the first page? I've got put a couple of free options there for you. Google Analytics. If you don't have Google Analytics on your site, you need to do that today. It's essentially a phenomenal tool that will connect data for you about how visitors get to your site, the, the path they take throughout your site, the pages that they leave your site, the, the marketing channels that you use to get them. It is a phenomenal tool to use. And it's very easy to install. You just need a tiny little code to put into the head section of your website. Google Search Console. It's similar to Google Analytics, but it takes more of an admin function. Uh, get familiar with the data that this provides. It also shows you the queries or the keywords that people got to your site, which pages they arrived on. You can take this information and put that into your keyword tracking tool. Brand mentions. Now, this is the final thing I do to start collecting data. You need to know about who is talking about your brand or your keywords online. There's two free tools that you can set up fairly easily and they will email you daily, weekly, monthly, a list of everybody who's talking about you online. So, I mean, why is that useful? Well, first of all, any negative criticism you can respond to instantaneously. Any positive people talking about you online, you can reach out to them and start building relationships with them. Also, you need to track your keywords. You need to find out who's talking about your competitors. Because if people are talking about your competitors, then why can't they be talking about you? You need to know which journalists are talking about your keywords. If there's a journalist who's constantly talking about your industry, then that's someone who you can reach out to and start to build a relationship with. <coughs> so from the example site, these are the kind of brand terms and keywords that I would start to track. So, variations on the URL and kind of the main kind of keywords that you'd start to look at. So, on-site SEO. On-site SEO is essentially the process of making sure that your website is, uh, appeals to the search engines, that they can get to your site, that they can understand the pages, that they understand which page, each, well, which keyword each page is targeting, what the purpose of your site is. I mean, this is, a, this is an extreme example, but we had a client who came on board with us probably about a year ago, and they were getting frustrated because their web developers had, had built them a site and it wasn't anywhere in the search engines. And we only made a couple of very, very small little tweaks to the site. But after three months, the organic traffic increased by over 900%. Now, a lot of people completely ignore the on-site SEO, and it's becoming more and more important, especially because you have full control over the way you do this. So you need to make sure that the search engines understand the purpose of who you are, especially as I'd imagine most of you have brand new websites. You know, why, why would a search engine care about what you do? You have to make it very, very clear to them about who you are and what you're trying to do. So keywords. The keywords that you choose can make or break your campaign. I've lost track of the amount of times we've got a client come on board and they've said, I want to rank for this keyword. That's all I care about. I don't care about anything else. 
when you look at the data of those keywords, we can go back to them and say, yeah, that's fine, but it's pointless ranking for that keyword because the monthly searches on that keyword is a zero. So, yeah, you might appear number one in search engines, but you're not going to get any traffic from it. So what's the point as a marketing strategy to employ that? So keywords are the foundation of online marketing. Choosing the right keywords can literally make or break your campaign. But you have to understand the purpose of keywords. See so this graph here, it shows the level of competition against the probability of conversion. As startups, you will not rank for terms, one word phrases such as shoes. That just won't happen. Those, those search results are dominated by big, well-known brands that have been around for a very long time. You'll find it extremely difficult to rank for two to three word phrases such as men's shoes. But the more descriptive phrases are what's known as the long tail keywords. Mainly reference that because this is meant to look a little bit like a tail. These are the kind of keywords that you should be targeting. So keywords like red, night, men's running shoes. They're extremely descriptive. Much lower in competition. But the other benefit of them is, is they have a higher level of conversion. If you think about it, if, I'm, if I go to, this, to, a, to, to Google and I search for shoes... I'm very much at the research stage of what I'm doing. You know, I might look through and think, oh, there's, there's loads of women's shoes here. I'll change it. I'll do men's shoes. But I'm still, I'm still, I don't really know what I want. If I'm searching for four or five words within Google, I'm pretty much certain to know what I want to buy. You know, I want, I want men's shoes, I want night shoes, and I want them to be running shoes. That's, that's a very quantifiable search. And it's much further along the buying process than just something as simple as shoes. So, how do we find keywords? One of the tools that we use on a daily basis is a tool called SEM Rush. Now, this tool will allow you to put your site, your competitors to site, any site you want in, and it will show you the keywords that they're ranking for, not only in organic search, but also in the paid advertising and how much they're paying for each keyword. If your competitors are paying for keywords, then it's a pretty good guess that those keywords convert into customers. Now, SEM Rush, we've got a, we do a lot of webinars and things with this company, and they have offered for uh, members of the Ingenuity Lab to use their software for free. Um, the Ingenuity Lab will be sending around an email with uh, the contact details of the people at SEM Rush who will be happy to set you all up for account for free. Another great option is use Google. It's a very simple option. Start typing your keywords into the search results and Google's autocomplete function will fill out keywords for you. These keywords are keywords that people actively search in the search engine for. Uh, if, you, if you do a search, scroll down to the bottom and it will show related searches. Again, these are keywords that people are actually searching for. Click on these results and look at their related searches. Use a tool called Ubersuggest. It's a brilliant free tool that scrapes Google's auto-suggest function. I put in one word, skincare. I got 250 key keywords back from that. You, you then take all these keywords that you've amassed and you put them into Google Keyword Planner. Now, this tool is originally for Google AdWords, which is Google's ad system. But it shows you the average monthly searches of each keyword. It shows you the level of competition within AdWords. Now, everything doesn't correlate perfectly, but a high level of competition in AdWords usually corresponds to a high level of competition in SEO. Because if it's a high level of competition in AdWords, it usually converts into customers. And if a keyword converts into customers, then you can kind of guess that people will try and target it for SEO. So for our example site here, you could look and say, well, avocado face mask, low level of competition. That could be a pretty decent keyword to target for a product page. 
or DIY face mask or how to make a face mask would be a pretty decent blog post to put on. No. Pretty decent monthly searches and kind of a low level of competition. Finally, once you've narrowed your keyword list down, you can look at Google Trends. Now, Google Trends is a brilliant tool that shows you the historical uh, popularity of keywords. So you can say, okay, so how to make a face mask. Is this, is this a keyword that is rising in popularity or is it a keyword that's falling in popularity? You know, don't pick keywords that are slowly dying out. The trick is to pick keywords that are slowly building up. Okay, so architecture. So, website architecture is essentially the way your website is structured. Now, a lot of, a lot of websites mess this up. But essentially, you want a clean, clear, concise, structured architecture. This is mainly done through the URL structure. So it should resemble some kind of family tree structure with your home page at the top and your category pages beneath, and your <coughs> subcategory, and then if you're an e-commerce store, your product pages. Not only is this good for users because they can understand where a page fits within the site, it's also great for the search engines because one, you're putting your keywords into, in, in, into the URL, but also it can say that this page here is clearly, I don't know, um, well, it fits clear within the hierarchy. So, much like this, for the fridge freezers, it can tell that this page is very clearly about fridge freezers. So, metadata. Metadata essentially shows how your website's going to look within the search engine results page. So, for example, meta title. The meta title has a direct impact on search engine rankings. You only have about 50 to 55 characters to work with. It's not an exact number because if you think about it, a, a, a capital I takes up a lot less room than a, a capital Q. It's important to put your keyword within the title tag. Every page needs a unique title tag with that page's unique keyword within it. Meta description. While this once was a ranking factor, it isn't anymore. But that's not to say it, should, it shouldn't be ignored. If you're, if you're looking at a typical search engine results page, this is essentially your piece of real estate. This is where you sell to your customer. Like, click on my result, don't click on my competitor's result. So you need to craft your meta description to be highly targeted, to encourage people to click on what you're selling. You can audit your meta tags very, very easily. There's a tool called Screaming Frog, which you can download to your desktop. As long as your site's under 500 URLs, you can, you can use it completely for free. Once you download it, you just chuck in your URL, and you can choose page titles or meta descriptions from the tabs at the top. And then the drop-down tag, you can see the missing duplicate, ones that are too long, ones that are too short. And then you can just export all of that data to Excel to make it easier to work with. So if we look at the example site, 16 title tags are over 65 characters. You see how it's truncated within the search results? Also, neither one, the title or description, really makes me want to click on it. I sort of know what it's about, but not entirely. There are 40 pages below 30 characters. Compare how much room there is in the, the top compared to the bottom, especially for the description. Does one include the meta title? Yeah, so the meta title and the meta description. Yeah. So the meta title is essentially, if you think of the web page as a, a document, that's the title of the document. You need to include the page keyword within especially the title. I mean, that's the home page. 
but every page needs to have the keyword included within the title tag. So, header tags. If the meta title is a title of the document, then the header tags are kind of like the chapters. So, imagine an essay. You've got the title at the top. The header tags are essentially the different subsections within that document. Much as we see here. So, each of these would have content within them. This helps the search engine understand the different subsections of each page. So every page must have one and only one H1 tag. And then beneath that, you can have multiple H2s, and within that, H3s, and you can have H4s and 5s. This is just structuring your web page correctly. In include your keywords and variations of your keywords within your header tags. This just allows the search engine to understand what the page is about. So content. Now, this part of it is content just from a purely technical <coughs> point of view. We'll come on to kind of more creative content later on, but for the purpose of this part is purely from a technical standpoint. Now, search engines are information engines. The way that Google works is that it wants to provide the best result for the user. Now, a common mistake that e-commerce sites make is they copy and paste the manufacturer's description onto their product pages. Now, Google hates this. Why, why, why would it serve your page to its users if it's already found the same chunk of text on 10 other sites? The simple answer is it won't. So you need to fill your site with fresh, original content. Not only are the information engines, Google is essentially a text-based crawler. So the more text you put on your, page, on, on your site, the better. Do not copy and paste. Copy and pasting is essentially worthless. If you look at this graph here, this is the average content length or text-based content length, the top 10 results in Google. So all the average top pages are all over 2,000 words long. The top three pages are nearer 2,500 words long. If you don't have content on your site or on your pages, Google won't understand the purpose of that page. It shows a, a real disconnect between the way that humans view the web and the way the search engines view the web. Humans are very visual. No one reads content. No one, no one reads an in-depth article. People skim, people look at the images. But a search engine can't really understand images. It's getting better at understanding through machine learning and things like that. But still, images and videos and things like that it doesn't really have a clue. So it needs the text on the site to understand it. So if you look at the example site, there's no content on the home page. There's no content on the category pages. There's 30 to 50 words on the product pages. And there's about 200 words on the blog posts. Now, if this was my site and I had full control over it, I would be incredibly aggressive with a content strategy. I would put 3,000 words on the home page, on the category pages, on the product pages. I would do 5,000 to 7,000 words on the blog posts. Now, you may think this is being a bit over the top, but you have new websites. Google. Google, why should Google listen to you? Essentially, the process of SEO, especially for new websites, is forcing them to understand what you're about. <coughs> the search engines crawl millions and millions of websites every day. So you need to stand out from the crowd. As soon as you're in a better position, then you can slowly cut down on the level of content that you have on your site. But as you launch, you need a lot of content on your site. And I know what some of you are probably thinking. 
I don't want huge bulks of text all over my website. The latest trends are the websites are slick and clean with very, very little text-based content. Well, the simple fact is those websites don't rank. Un un unless you're a highly trusted, authoritative site that's been around for a very long time, you can't have a thin website with little content on there. An important thing to do is to check which pages of your site are indexed within the search engines. Many people forget this step, but it's imperative to find out how the search engines understand what your website is about. So you run a site search. If you search for site semicolon and then your root domain, so that's no www, no http, no https, just the root domain in Google, you, sh you should know how many pages are on your site. You can count them fairly easily. Count the product pages, category pages, home page. Google will tell you how many pages are indexed. If those pages don't match up, there's something wrong. So if you look at the example site as well, your home page should always appear at the first result. If, if it doesn't, then you've got something seriously wrong with your site. The first thing I notice. Well, when you do a site search, what you're essentially looking for is things that look out of place. So the first thing I notice is the second result is targeting a foreign language. We don't want those pages indexed within the search results. From a UK search results, we should only see UK pages. If you are targeting multiple lo locations and languages, you can use what's known as a href lang tag. You can implement this quite easily through plugins through your CMS. The next thing I notice is there's a confliction between protocols. The first and the third results are HTTPS, while the second result is www. Now, you may also see that some results have a confliction between a www. and a non www. indexed. These are essentially two exactly same versions of the websites becoming indexed. So you have two copies of your site within the search results, which means not only does Google see two exact copies of the same website, but you're also competing with yourself. You need to pick one variation and choose that. I also see admin and search pages indexed. Now, there's no reason for them to be indexed. You don't want these pages to rank. There is no real need for it. So these would need to be removed. The website also has dynamic URLs indexed. So all the work you did creating a clean, clear, structured hierarchy is just put to waste now because these completely bypass it. These are often created from the website's filtering system. Let's say you have a bunch of products and you choose, <coughs> I want these in red. And the, and the content on the page filters. You can use a tool called SiteLiner. Now, SiteLiner will check your site for internal duplicate content. So we put the test site through and it found a large amount of duplicate content. In this case, the results are slightly skewed because of the, because of the lack of content on the home page and the category pages. It was picking that up as duplicate content. You can use a tool called Copyscape. This will check a, a, a URL for external duplicate content. So, fixing duplicate content. There are lots of different ways to fix it. If you find external duplicate content, you'll probably need to rewrite your content. But most of the other ways can be fixed using plugins. For instance, if you use WordPress, the Yoast WordPress plugin will fix most of these for you. Just on the external duplicate content, is that, for instance, if you sell to a shop and they copy and paste your yep. information? Yeah. Yep. So, structured data, often referred to as schema.org. Now, this was brought in as a collaboration between Google, Bing, Yahoo, and I think Yandex as well. Now, structured data, you've probably seen it in the search results. It's, it's, it's a way of... Um, helping the, the search engines understand more about what your site does. 
And it also gives the user a great piece of information about your site. For instance, you've probably seen the results for recipes or reviews or cinema times or anything like that. Structured data is massively important to search now. If you don't have structured data on your site, you're seriously lacking behind. So structured data can be set up fairly easily using plugins. Um, it's probably advisable not to use the plugins because the plugins are fairly basic. Um, but if you go to schema.org, there's a huge list of everything that you can set up. Literally anything and anything that you can think of to set up on your website can be surrounded by structured data. And you can use Google's testing tool to test it. So say for the example site, it picked up the products and everything passed. But there's so much more that you could do. They could do organization. They could do a whole host of things that will help this search engine understand the purpose of the site while also giving the user a great experience. If you're an e-commerce store and you have the stars underneath the title tag of the number of reviews for your products, it's huge for encouraging people to click through to your site. <coughs> so sitemaps. Sitemaps have no benefit to the user whatsoever, but they're essentially a list of URLs that a search engine uses to make sure that they're indexing every page on, on your site. You can usually find your sitemap by type, typing sitemap.xml at the end. Now, most of your CMSs will produce your sitemap. If it doesn't produce it for you, then you can use plugins to, to do this for you. And whenever you post a new page or a post, your sitemap will auto-regenerate. Um, so you won't need to do anything more. But it's highly advisable to submit your sitemap within Google's Search Console. This not only tells the search engine to index a site, but also index any pages that it might not have found before. So speed. Speed is vitally important as it not only a core ranking factor within Google's algorithm, but it's also important for user experience. I'm sure you've been on websites before that have taken an age to load, and instead of, instead of waiting, you've just gone back to the search results and clicked on the next option. I try and make sure that every website that I work with loads in under one second, which is very doable. You can use a tool called GT Metrics. This is a free tool online that essentially it tests the website for numerous different things. What you're aiming for is at least 85% in both of these, page speed score and Y slow score. Ideally, you want A in both of these categories. You see on the example site now, loads in 4.4 seconds. For me, that's not good enough. I want a lightning fast um, site. If we were to scroll <coughs> down this page, it would literally give you what you need to improve on. You just take this result and search for that in Google. You can usually find lots of plugins that will solve these problems for you. You, know, you don't need to be a technical web developer to solve these problems. You just need other people have done the work and created plugins that will fix these for you. So, off-site. Now, off-site SEO is all about creativity. This is where you move from being a technical developer into more of a, a technical slash creative marketeer. Now, when Google first came along, there were already search engines. But these were looking at kind of crude on-page factors, such as the amount of key times a keyword appeared in the body, of a, the body of the page. The thing is, this led website owners to, to create text that was basically unreadable for humans because they just stuffed the page full of keywords. And Google came along and said, well, this isn't really working. So two guys at Stanford, they came from an academic background, and they noticed something within academic papers. They noticed that when one academic was writing a research paper and they wanted to cite another academic, they would literally just cite it within the body of the paper. And they thought, OK, so if we take this academic paper and we turn that into HTML, which is basically the foundation of the web. 
and then we put that document on a server, or it's essentially a web page. And that citation becomes a HTML link. So links became one of the core ranking factors within Google's algorithm. They essentially, if, if, if you look at links as votes, so one website is voting for another website. So the more links you have, the more popular Google sees you. So essentially, that became kind of the core aspect of Google's ranking algorithm, along with the on-page factors as well. But links became the most important aspect. <coughs> now, things have changed a lot since then. Because, because, because what people did was they just manipulated it. At the, at the start of Google's algorithm, it was about quantity. So the amount of links that you had means that whoever had the most links appeared higher than the people who didn't. Now, we kind of measure the trust and authority of sites now. So it's, so it's about quality over quantity. So there's a few different ways that we can measure quanti uh, quality. So if, if, if you think that a link from the BBC is worth a lot more than a link from a blog that was set up last week. So we use Majestic SEO. Majestic SEO has created their own metric that allows us to kind of understand the trustworthiness of a link. So they have citation flow and trust flow. Now citation flow and trust flow, they're, they're both marked out of 100. Citation flow is the number of links that are pointing towards your site. And trust flow is how many or how close you are to highly trusted websites. So when you're looking to kind of to understand how important or how valuable other sites are, you're kind of looking for kind of a trust flow of about 15 and citation flows to be close as possible. Is this only inbound or is it outbound as well? This is inbound, yeah. We also use tools called Ahrefs. This, this is hands down my favorite tool. This is a paid tool, much like Majestic, although there are free options for both. But this, this tool doesn't have as good metrics that Majestic has uh, created. What it does is it has a wealth of information for you to look at. So if you put a, a website in, you can get a whole host of information back. So this is kind of a little bit longer way of assessing a website, but essentially what you're looking for here it's a huge spike. You know, that's what, like 60,000 links in about a day. Now, that is usually a sign that someone has built a lot of low quality links to the website. And this is a website you should probably ignore. You also want to look at what's known as the anchor cloud. Now, this, this is important because the anchor text that is used in a HTML link, so the bit that you click on, is an important aspect in the way that Google assesses the value of a link. If you have a link that's keyword rich with the keywords that you want to target, it is worth more than a link that just says click here. So what people do is that they will build a lot of low quality links, such as this spike here, with the exact match anchor text. These, these kind of tactics don't really work that well anymore. But if you find that a website has this, then it's probably not a website that you want to link from. You also want to check that the Anchor Cloud doesn't include keywords that are not associated with that domain. For instance, if you're looking to build links in an industry such as health or beauty or face masks, then if the keywords contain keywords like gambling, it's probably something you should stay away from. So the key for link building is to provide value. It's the only way to do it. And essentially, as startups and new business owners, you have to become an authority. Now, the only way to do that, really, is through content. There was a, there's a business in my industry that some of you may be aware of. They do social media like management. They're called Buffer. Now, when Buffer launched, about six months before they launched, what they did was they, they, they noticed the top industry blogs and news sites within that industry. So let's say they picked 20 big blogs and news sites. 
they wrote in-depth pieces of research and articles about that industry and published them on every single one of those sites. So by the time their product launched, everybody knew who they were, that there wasn't any kind of gap to market. Everyone was desperate to try. So the, the key to what we're doing is to publish really in-depth, well-thought-out, well-researched articles and pieces of research that will establish you as an industry leader. They're linkable assets. These are types of content that you can create that will not only help to establish your business as an authority, but also attract links. So you can do things like evergreen content. These are things that just don't go away. You know, here we're talking about things like the ultimate guide to whatever your business is. Topical content. Top of the funnel content. Things like, so, so this is how-tos. Problem solving content. Buying guides. Buying guides are a brilliant way to do it if you run an e-commerce site. So the important thing is not to just jump in and start creating content. Much like keyword research, you don't just pick your keywords out of thin air. You need to look at what topics your target market consumes. And you can do that through a tool called BuzzSumo. This essentially picks the most popular content by keyword, and it's sourced that by social media shares. Essentially, if a, if a piece of content is doing well on social, it means that people like it, people are consuming it, and people want to share it. So therefore, you can say, OK, well, let's pick themes out here, things that are doing well. And let's build upon those themes, and let's incorporate them into our own content strategy. You can also pick types of content. Does your industry consume video? Do they do infographics? Do interviews do really well? <coughs> One of the best ways to establish yourself as an authority is to solve problems. It's a pretty simple one. You look at forums, question and answer sites, how-tos. You, you can look at your own internal website site search. Think about the questions that your customers ask you. Look at social media. Look at the common problems within your industry. And then write content that solves that problem. But the problem is, as soon as you just start building all this content, that's not enough. Much like any other marketing channel, once you create your marketing collateral, then you need to tell people about it. You need to get the word out. People need to understand that you're there. You need to tell people, hey, I've just created this amazing resource. So how do we do that? We do that through prospecting. But prospecting is just finding the right people who will love our content. So a great way to do that is through Google search. So these are examples of advanced search engine operators. So this first one here will search for the keyword of the key phrase plus the exact phrase become a contributor. The second one, the industry name, so let's say healthcare, plus the, the title tag must contain the word interview and the word job, see how it's got a minus sign next to it, must not appear at all on that page. So essentially what you're looking for there is people who are looking to do interviews. The keyword or phrase or the term top resources. I, I advise you to follow this link for a full guide and play, play around with these as much as possible. As I said before, not all links are created equal. So, create a database of journalists. The press links are some of the best links you can get because not only will they pass on highly authoritative signals to the search engines, but they'll also pass a lot of traffic if you get them right. So tool, tools like Help a Reporter Out, Source Bottle or Press Request will email you daily, weekly, requests that journalists have for creating content. 
So let's say a journalist is doing a piece about skincare. They will email you and they will say, we are looking for people who know about skincare. And all you have to do is email them back with your pitch. If you use Twitter, hashtag journal request and hashtag PR request are a similar thing. I advise you to use these because they are extremely useful. Things like Harrow, help a reporter out, is slightly overwhelming at times with the number of emails you get. And you have to be very, very quick on how you do it because it, it's highly competitive. So you're moving on to outreach. Essentially now, you've got a piece of content that you love. You've found people who you think will love it. So now you've, you've got to get in touch with them. So one of the most easiest ways to do it is email. Social media works very well as well. But essentially what you're looking for here is for them to place a link on their site, or at least visit the site or share it on social media. Now, website owners are inundated with requests from people trying to get links <coughs> from SEO agencies to people trying to do SEO on their site. So you need to think about why someone would link to you. So before you even press send on your email, you need to go back and say, why would this person link to me? If you don't have a good enough reason for it, then you need to start again. Maybe your content isn't good enough. Maybe the, the body of the email isn't good enough. The subject lines are vital for someone to open an email. Link outreach, especially in this kind of aspect, is all about numbers. You have to kind of bash numbers out. So, so in summary, use the keywords that your customers well, understand the keywords that your customers use and use them on your site. Never underestimate the importance of on-site SEO. Make sure that you fine-tune your website for both your search engines and your users. Create engaging content that users love. And create content designed to attract links. And then tell people about it. Right. The slide deck's available to download if anyone wants to download it. Um, Right, so any questions? So you mentioned as a startup company, you would, you would use more aggressive uh, policy in terms of creating content. Yep. And so you would put 3,000 words on your front page. But from a consumer point of view, if I go to a new website, I want to buy something, I want a visually appealing pictures with short and precise descriptions. Yep. If it's too long, then I'll... I'll probably turn away thinking it's not worth reading, or I won't read it. So where did you find the balance between those two? Yeah, well, that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a common problem. Uh, so the, the question was, how do you find a balance between, uh, between adding loads of content onto your site and having a site that appeals to users? Yeah. So, it's a, so it's a common problem. And one easy solution is to put, firstly, the text down at the bottom of the home page near the footer. And you can also use expanders. So you could show a little bit of content and then you could have such as a read more tab that expands. So if someone does want to read it, then they can. But essentially no one's probably going to read that content. It's mainly there just for the search engines. But you just have to be careful with kind of read more expanders because sometimes they are they're employed by JavaScript and sometimes Google can't read them. So you just need to make sure that you're using the right one. But that's kind of a decent compromise where you could show a few lines of text and then a body that drops down, but it keeps kind of the, the style of the site in place. And in What, so, what, index PDF, did you say? Yeah, to, to include, like, PDF links and, you know, links to, to more information for those on your site who might want to go a bit further on that subject. Okay, so I would probably, I probably wouldn't index uh, PDFs. Like, you can do it, um, but I probably wouldn't do it. I'd probably you take that information and put it onto a separate web page itself. Yeah. 
So if you put social media newsfeed on your homepage, it, it, it doesn't add more content. Usually the, the news feeds for social media are purely taken from um, a JavaScript pull-in. So Google can't usually see that. Um, I mean, it's, it's useful for users, but there's not a lot of benefit for an SEO point of view. So, how important is it to find um, someone to do it for you as a startup? Um, well, I guess it all depends on your business. Uh, every business is different. Different channels will appeal to different businesses. Um, you know, we've had people come to us wanting to be clients, and we've turned them away and said, you know, email marketing is probably a better avenue for you to take. Um, so it all kind of depends. It mainly depends on what keywords you want to target. If you want to target crazy, ridiculous keywords, then it's, uh, SEO is probably not the best way to go. Uh, so when you take one project, how long does it normally take to finish all the SEO adjustments? So how long does a project take? Yeah. It takes, um, again, it kind of depends on the keywords and how old the website is. Yeah. Um, so if a website doesn't have any rankings whatsoever, and they want to rank, it usually takes about six months to a year um, by improving the on-site and then outreaching for links and things like that. Is it expensive to hire experts to do that? Um, well, we are quite expensive, but you can probably find uh, uh, decent people, kind of local people in Nottingham that can do a fairly decent rate. Thank you. Um, how is CEO or SEO relevant to the up market? What do you mean by the up market? So it seems like the app market. So oh, like the app market. Yeah, yeah, the app market is like a separate entity, even though it's still search based. All right, so the difference between kind of traditional kind of search engine in the, in the kind of Google and the app market search engines are fairly different. Um, the app market has its own kind of ranking algorithm. It's a lot more kind of old school in the way that it uh, ranks apps. So you kind of have to stuff your pages on the app page kind of full of keywords as much as possible. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's difficult. Links still matter, but they matter less. It's more kind of stuffing your app page full of keywords to help it rank. So is there any resources uh, to learn about app marketing? Uh, yeah, I've got a... Uh, an ebook that one of my colleagues made a while ago. I'll, I'm happy to send that to you. Um, anybody else? What well, if you got sort of a selection of products that have um, sort of say one defining factor that's different, um, be it say it's a material or something like that, but a customer will be looking for a specific product with that material. Um, so you have lots of similar products on your website, okay. and the only difference is that material. For instance, yeah. I mean, how do you do? You need to change all the content for that because obviously you get a lot of duplication. Yeah. So the question was, um, what do you do if you've got similar content? Let's say you've got one product that's like blue and one product that's red or something like that, or all the other materials. Yeah, customer will be specifically searching for, say, blue or red. So, so the way to do it is, well, you've got two options really. You can combine them into one product page and then fill that with a ton of content, but have kind of split them up into sections where your header tags and the different De describing each one, or you'd have to write completely dis new descript content for each page and yeah. really force home so the title tag, the H1 tag, and all the kind of header tags would include that exact phrase. Um, it kind of depends on how competitive. I'd be tempted to combine them all into one page yeah. um, and maybe have like a carousel of products at the top or something like that. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Amazon, what ranking within Amazon itself? Um, well, ranking within Amazon have their own kind of ranking algorithm. Um, that's, it is slightly different. That's, a lot of that's based on the kind of reviews that you get. Um, 
you, you can you know you can do the same thing ranking Amazon pages within Google just by building links to them and things like that. Um, but yeah, Amazon's algorithm is a lot more kind of review based, and you know filling out your kind of product pages as much as possible. Does Amazon and eBay are they good to do to link back to your site? Yeah, yeah, they're not bad. Um, yeah, I mean they're they're, they're trusted sites, but I, so so yeah, it's it's, it's worth adding in. Um, yeah, so we expect results. It can take like six months to a year or so. Um, it, it, it all depends on how competitive the keyword is. And it can be a continual process. It usually is. Um, I mean, usually when you've kind of achieving with one keyword, a client will <coughs> then want to achieve with another keyword or give you a new batch of keywords to kind of target. So copying and pasting, so I mean the question was, uh, is it all right to was it copy and paste in the terms and conditions? Yeah. So things like that don't really matter because you'll never want to rank those terms and condition pages. So, so it doesn't really matter in the long term. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, so essentially, you, you never want someone to find those pages through a search engine. Like they, they might go to your site and then click on those pages, but they're never going to find those pages through a Google search. No, no, that won't matter. I mean, you're probably better to rewrite it just for tidying things up, but it, it won't matter. It only really matters about the pages that you actually want to rank. I mean, you can even tell Google just not to visit those pages on your site as well. Does that matter if you've got a product page, then, for instance, and you've got, say, a warranty information or some set text that's duplicated across the each page? So for things like that, you just need to add more content to the page. Um, to override it? Yeah, to basically yeah. fill it out. So I'd kind of overwhelm it. Um, so that, that's kind of the best way to do it. Yeah. Um, like, is it something you have to create specially, or is it just automatically transferred to the Google search after you have your website? Or so, you have to take time to create the um, Sorry, like, please repeat that. You know, you use Google search. I don't search for something. But this, I think that was, if I have a better understanding of everything, I'm trying to grab it anyway. Um, when you search for something on Google search, it comes out with really, it. Just like example of what you showed me, Leon Mask, do you have to create it yourself or it automatically get from your website? What, your page being listed within Google? Yeah. Um, Google will, so the question was, do you have to kind of submit, do anything to kind of get your site to appear in Google? Uh, Google will find your site automatically. I've, I've run tests where I've just built a site and not built any links to it, and I've just left it. And it will appear in the search engines, because Google is constantly crawling. And it will crawl through your host, and it will find the other sites. Um, so you don't need to do anything. If you want to speed up the process a bit more, you can submit it in Google Search Console. So just by submitting the sitemap tells Google to go and crawl the site. Um, 